Morning, everybody. Morning. Favorite to ask. Uh, this morning, I got an email that said our campus is adopting Poll Everywhere, which is a software that allows you to do like quizzes and polls and things like that. One of the things that the software that I, I was looking at really quick this morning, what it allows you to do is like a Q&A. Now, I've always wanted something, and I've tried to code my own, and it's never seemed to work, where students can ask questions on your phones and then vote questions up or down, right? And then like every 10 to 15 minutes, I can look at the questions and see what questions you have out there, that kind of stuff. But let's face it, not everybody likes raising their hand or speaking out loud, right? So if you are willing, this is just a total test. I have no idea how this is going to go. It's probably going to blow up in my face. I think it's already caused one technical problem this morning. Supposedly, you can go to this URL, okay, and it should pull up a poll that says Physics 4C class questions. You can type in a question, you can visit it if you don't have a question, and you can vote questions up or down. And here in about 10, 15 minutes, supposedly, there'll be a slide in my keynote that should automatically update with all of the questions that I can see right away. So again, this is just a test. Feel free to ask whatever questions you want. It can be about class, it can be about something else. I don't care. Right? Okay, this is just a test, right? Don't let it distract you from what we're doing, but uh, if, you wouldn't be, if you wouldn't mind, or at least trying the tool out, I really need to see kind of what happens on the back end and all that sort of stuff before I decide if this is something to use in my classes. Uh, it, there's a high bar for technology, for me to incorporate technology in my classes, and if I feel like a technology is getting in the way of the learning process, it's dead. So if this gets in the way of the learning process, I'll be able to see it. Hopefully, you'll tell me about it. All right. Um, we went from a speed run through thermodynamics to <laughs> a slow slog through optics. And we haven't even gotten out of chapter 33. We'll get out of chapter 33 today. We'll start chapter 34. But I wanted to do an example of uh, Snell's law, right? Kinds of problems you might be up against, right? So we got this tank. And it's full of, uh, it's completely full of water, so it's like right up to the brim, okay? And we know the diameter is three meters across. And the sunlight, right, streaming onto the tank at a certain time of day, like completely, like, it, it, everything's in shadow, right? So the sunlight is hitting at the edge of the tank right here and refracting down into the tank so that all of this area is in shadow, right? Okay. We'll say that the sun is, is like over here. Okay. And one time in one of my classes, my students said, Mr. Bailey, you have to always do a smiley face on the sun. I was like, okay. So... We have this sunlight coming in, and the sunlight, the ray coming from the sun, okay, gets, gets bent, right? But they're telling me that the angle above the horizon is 28 degrees. Is that the angle we need? No. We need the angle to the normal, right? So what angle are we going to use? Which is uh, 62. Okay, so if we're going to find, right, um, the depth of the tank, and I'm going to call the depth of the tank here, we call it D. Stranger things have happened, right? We'll call the depth of the tank D. If I'm going to find that depth, I'm kind of staring at the fact that I know I have three meters on this side of the triangle. I'm looking for the other side of the triangle. What's left that I need in order to pull this off? An angle. I could, if I could find the hypotenuse, that'd be good, but finding the hypotenuse is difficult. So we have to find this angle right here. I'm going to call it theta 2 because what angle is theta 1? It, no, the 62. So in Snell's law, which governs how much the angles are going to change, how the ray is going to bend, 
theta 1, n1, that's the incident material. So what is the uh, sunlight traveling in before it hits the water? Air. It's in air, right? So what's the index of refraction of air? We're going to call it 1. So we have 1 times sine, why is that a 2? Theta 1, which is 62 degrees. Uh, index of refraction of water, we looked up, but is 1.33 times the sine of theta 2. So I've got the sine of 62 all over 1.33 inverse sine to get this angle. And when I did that, I got 41.5 degrees. So now that I know that theta 2 is 41.5, what secret magical trick am I going to use in order to find D? Not Pythagoras. Close. Because I don't know the hypotenuse. Oh, the touching and not touching. Well, yeah, that doesn't work here because the one thing that we need involves the adjacent and opposite sides. It's tangent. Right? It's going to be the, the 3 over D. So D is going to be equal to 3 divided by the tangent of 41.5 degrees, uh, which is 3.4 meters deep. Is snail fall hard? No. no. What's hard? Figuring out or what's going to trip you up? Tangent, angles, algebra, right? Right, like these are things that, these are the problems that are constant problems for us, aren't they? Even I mess up, right, on trick functions, all that kind of stuff, right? The actual like setting up the problem, other than them trying to trick us with the 28 degrees above the horizon, right? Um, so optics, we, so optics is easy, but there's a lot of little things that can trip you up. Right? So you got to, in optics, the thing that you really need to do is be aware that there's lots of little mistakes that can take place, and those little mistakes can kind of add up, right? And they can come out and get you if you're not careful. So there's a phenomenon that takes, uh, darn it, why does it do that? Come back. There's a phenomenon that takes place when... You have a material, say like water, and you have light traveling in that water, and it strikes the surface. Okay? Again, there's going to be an incident angle here, and there's going to be a refracted angle. And because of Snell's law, uh, I forgot my M2. The mathematics of Snell's law tells us that if you're going from a higher index material into a lower index material, the refracted angle will always be bigger than the incident angle. It's the reverse going the other way. So as light tries to travel, say, in water and go into air, there's going to be a point at which if we make angle theta 1 big enough, Theta 2 is going to reach what? Zero. Not 0. 90 degrees. Got to think from the normal, right? So turtle, total internal reflection happens. Turtle internal reflection. <laughs> when your second angle becomes 90 degrees. We can solve for what the incident angle is. So we do n1 sine, and now I'm going to call it theta sub c for theta critical, the critical angle, the angle at which we get this 90 degree refracted angle. It's going to be n2 sine 90 degrees. What's the sine of 90? One, right? Okay. So sine critical angle is N2 over N1. So the critical angle is going to be the inverse sine of N2 over N1. Don't write that down. 
Yeah. Well, you can write all that down, but um, write down what I'm about to write down is the most important part. Mathematically, what is the sine inverse function trying to do? Find an angle whose radian value is this number. Right? And how do I know it's a radian value? What happens when you divide two things with the same units? Units. They have no units. And no units means radians. Okay? If your calculator is in degrees mode, your calculator will automatically give you that angle not in radians, but in degrees. But the question the sine inverse is trying to ask is, what angle gives a value for the sine of this value? And what values of sine exist? What, what are the allowable values for sine of any angle? Negative 1 to 1. Negative 1 to 1 passing through 0. If your ratio inside there is bigger than 1, what is your calculator going to tell you? It's impossible. You can't have an angle whose sine value is bigger than 1. So, I don't like n1s and n2s when I'm dealing with a critical angle. I never can remember which one's 1 and 2. Is it the one on the top, one on the bottom, incident, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Maybe it's my dyslexic brain. It never makes sense to me. So what I do instead is I say, okay, well, I know that this only happens if you're going from a high index into a lower index material. It doesn't work the other way around. Only from high to low. So this has to be n low divided by n high. So with total internal reflection, in other words, the point at which your ray, your refracted ray, would reach 90 degrees, meaning it's no longer leaving the material. It's refracted so much that you get 100% reflection at the boundary. You can find it if you take the sine inverse of the low divided by the high index material. Any other way is going to get me mathematically weird numbers. So I always like to think of it as, as n low and n high. And in this case, right, since we're in water, that would be the, the high, and then the low would be the air that we go into. So why is it important that we have or understand total internal reflection? Where do you run into total internal reflection? Nowhere? Or everywhere? Let's investigate. We'll use this water tank as a parallel beam of light to demonstrate total internal reflection. A chemical in the water fluoresces when the light strikes it, showing the path of the beam. This mirror reflects the beam up to the surface of the water at any angle we choose. When the beam strikes the surface straight on, very little of the light is reflected. At a shallower angle, more of the light is reflected but most still passes out into the air, as shown by this thread screen. Notice the misalignment between the beam in water and the beam in air. The refraction, right? At a still shallower angle, the beam is refracted so much that it becomes parallel. To that the doesn't surface. look parallel. This is known as the critical angle situation. If the beam hits the surface at an angle shallower than the critical angle, all the light is reflected back at the surface and none crosses through. This is known as total internal reflection. Okay, to be clear, the number, the amount of transmitted light through the surface is zero. It's, this isn't like cheating physics, ignoring friction, or any of that kind of stuff. Like, when you hit the critical angle, none of the light is transmitted through the surface. All of it gets reflected. It is 100% pure reflection. So here we got a drawing of a source of light, a bunch of rays coming off of it, right? And it's, the idea here is as, as the ray, right, as the angle of incidence gets bigger and bigger and bigger, again, because we're measuring from the normal, right? The angle of refraction going from high to low is always bigger. And so, 
the refractive angle is always leading, and then you get to that sort of critical point where you're at that 90 degree refraction angle, and that's the point where the light can no longer leave the material and it is totally internally reflected. I know it sounds weird to call it total internal reflection when it's really a refraction phenomenon, right? That's driving it. But nonetheless, reflection, refraction, they happen at these boundaries. So why is this important? Why is this everywhere? Well, this is what it looks like when you're underwater, say, in a swimming pool. Okay? Anybody's ever gone down there and spent any time down there looking up knows that you can see like a circle of things that are outside the pool, but at a certain point, you stop seeing what's outside the pool. You just see a reflection of what is in the pool. So we have here a case where we can see out of the pool the lights above the pool, and you can see the boundary line where it goes from refraction to total internal reflection. You're scuba diving. <laughs> this is what looking up looks like. Okay? Minus your dive partner sticking their face in the picture. Okay? You you see this this circle of light, right? And it's not that everything else is dark. Usually you just see a reflection of what the ocean bottom is around you, right? The, the camera here is being fooled because of the very bright sky. But the, the critical angle in water is like 42 degrees, 41.9, something like that, which means that there's like an 84, maybe it's, no, it's 47, 90, there's like a 96 degree field of view. So looking up, going 96 degrees all the way across, 40 miles on one side, 40 miles on the other, right? You can see out, you can see the sky, you can see the sun, right? but everything else is gonna be a total internal reflection of what's already in the water with you. So why is this important or injured? Oh, I forgot. I'll show you a video of this. I have the actual demo. I'll be right back. pandemic this is the first time I get a chance to use it let's hope let's see if it works this is I didn't even test this this morning that's how purple red one okay green. Green is the brightest okay so what I have here if you can see it is a, is a squiggly Right, okay, it's a piece of acrylic, right, that's uh, wrapped around in sort of a squiggle. And it's transparent, okay, which means light. I should be able to shine light into one end. And if I can get total internal reflection to happen inside of this thing, it should come out the other. Now, I bet you, yeah, it looks like they put some optical noise in here to get some reflection. Where's the green one go? Nope. All right, let's see. Can you see? Can you see the? Is the dot going out somewhere? Okay. <laughs> That's not the dot. So it's, okay, good. It's not making a dot, which is not what it's supposed to do. But do you see the bright light on the end of the right end of the thing? You can see that there's kind of light. Maybe you see where I'm like holding it down here. For some reason it's light. It lights up when it's near my fingers because it's bouncing off of stuff. So, but, but it's very bright on the end, but it's not so bright in the coils, right? Okay. That's because the laser beam is totally internally reflected inside of the acrylic. This acrylic has an index of refraction high enough compared to air that for basically any incident angle the laser makes into the material, okay, the light is totally internally reflected all the way around until it exits out the other end. Why would you ever want to shine light into a piece of glass and have it come out the other end and not come out the side? Fiber. Fiber. Just describe the fiber optic. Okay, and this is why 
total internal reflection is everywhere in your lives. Because fiber optics are the backbone of all the social medias your generation loves. I know you don't all like it, okay? But without fiber optics, there's no way we can have the bandwidth that we have for the amount of information that's flying all over the internet. Right? So fiber optics are direct applications of total internal reflections. It's, you can get more information on a pulse of light or a wavelength of light than you can on the same, a different wavelength of light in, say, a copper wire. Copper wires aren't bad, but in terms of bandwidth, These lasers are better. These cubes will be used to show the type of total internal reflection which makes fiber optics communications possible. When a laser beam is aimed into the end of this tube, the beam bounces off the walls and is guided along the length of the tube emerging from the far end. The laser beam can also be guided along this curved tube. Real fiber optics cables can bend around corners without losing any of the light passing along them. Now, of course, those are engineered to show you the beam, right? Because if it was a good fiber optic, it wouldn't show the beam. So light comes out the ends. So inside a fiber optic, there's usually, well, it depends on the cable that you've got. But there's like three, two or three, four, some filaments in there. Okay, you have to have special terminations. But you have a light source, and the light really comes out the edge. It's not supposed to come out the edges. But anything can be a fiber optic as long as its index of refraction is high enough so that total internal reflection happens at the boundary, right? So that the light can't escape from the optic itself. We now demonstrate total internal reflection of laser light in a water jet. A laser is aligned such that its light passes through a water tank and into a tube at the bottom of the tank. Powdered coffee cream has been added to the water to make the laser beam more visible. When the stopper is removed, water squirts out of the tank into the container below. The laser beam is reflected internally and follows the water jet into the tank. In this close-up view, we can see the internal reflections of the laser beam in the water jet. So that laser beam is 100% staying inside of that water jet. It's not leaving. You'll see the instant it starts to leave. But do you see the bounces? Right? The total internal reflection? You'll all of a sudden see it dying off in the intensity. Right there. <coughs> see how the intensity just sort of cut right there? That's where the beam started to leave the water. Prior to that point, the beam was in the water the entire time. Minus the little tiny bit of coffee creamer that was letting us see, right, the laser beam in the water. Now, you don't make fiber optics out of water. Well, it gets a little messy, right? <laughs> you do need uh, special kinds of glass, optical glass, right? Um, that is very clear and very pure. Fiber optics often can be run for kilometers before needing any kind of amplification of the signal. Um, you can compare that with uh, copper, which depending on how fast you're sending the information, can really only go, go a few tens of meters, maybe like a hundred meters or so, before you need some sort of amplifier signal booster. To, it's because copper metals have all sorts of impurities in them. But um, anyway, total internal reflection has impacted your life in immeasurable ways, right? Um, I won't embarrass anybody. Am I the only person in the room that was born before the internet? Mostly. So, eh, close. Yeah, close. Right. Okay. Um, if, if you came in late, I'm testing something right now, okay? And so I'm about to hit the button. It's supposed to show me. Either my computer's going to crash or I'm just going to be a lot of funny questions. So let's, let's see what happens. Ah! So you guys did do it. And uh, how was it on your end? Like, was it easy to vote things up and down? OK. And it was anonymous, correct? I told it to be anonymous. Because I had the option to say to make you like sign in and all that kind of stuff. I didn't want to do that, right? OK. Uh, never. 
<laughs> uh, how does this work? It works like this, right? I hope you'll be able to go back on my end and see, like, maybe kind of all kinds of right? Cat, uh, dogs, um, cat, cats, okay. Dogs have owners, cats have staff. <laughs> Once you understand that, both are fine, okay? Uh, it's called a PC, okay? It's the best console, it's not a console, it's a computer. Uh, although, if I, if you had to pin me up against the wall, I would say Steam Deck. I'm still cheating. Um, <laughs> yeah. I like it. It's, it's updating in real time, which is pretty, pretty amazing. I'm wondering if OBS, so earlier today, I think my devices, like uh, my iPad and OBS and everybody were fighting over who gets to control the screen, and I kept getting black screens, right? So, so we get it in real time, it's good. Um, I can't remember. Oh, PlayStation or Xbox? I like PlayStation. I've never owned a PlayStation. Never owned a PlayStation. Never owned an Xbox. Okay. Um, I like Xbox's gaming service. Like, like they're, you pay, was it 10, 15 bucks a month or whatever it is, you get access to that library. Like, that library is amazing. Right? On the PlayStation, Horizon Zero Dawn. Like Xbox, like exclusive games, like the Xbox, Halo, I can't care less. Like it's just, <laughs> but the games that Sony makes, right? Sony Interactive Studios, mm -hmm. their games are pretty cool. So, anyway, um, what did you guys think of this thing? Like as a vehicle for actually asking your questions during class, would it be useful or not? Are, are you more inclined to pick up your phone and ask a question and have it be anonymous rather than throw your hand in the air when you're confused? Yes. Negative one. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Right. So um, anyway. I wonder, like, I wonder what would happen if I started with this, like, at the beginning of the semester, right? And there were like two times in a lecture period where this popped up, and I could stop and ask questions. Um, would you ever do this outside of class as a way to ask a question that you want answered at the beginning of lecture the next time you meet? Yes. Okay, I'm getting a lot more nods there. Rather than having it be like a live in-class thing, more of a, hey, everybody, how are we doing? How's your weekend go, blah, blah. OK, let's see what questions you have. Probably especially for a review. Right, well, OK. Oh, review. Oh, good point, right? Like reviewing for an exam, put your questions in here, and then you can go in and say, oh, yeah, I have that same question, or I hate that person down from there. <laughs> It didn't let me, I couldn't turn off the down vote, right? So I could see this getting abused a little bit, right? Um, kind of thing. Um, so who put 4B up there? <laughs> All right. So um, if, you have, if you have ideas, okay, or suggestions or anything where I could use, now of course I could use this for like quizzes, like our class quizzes. The problem with that is it always causes a little bit more friction. I like the quiz to be quick, get it down on paper, talk about it. It's also anonymous. Well, no, I can make it so that you have to like register for an account and log. Like again, there's more like friction there getting it started, and in the end, yeah, it'd be easier for me to get exactly what your quiz points are. I mm, Atlas, I know that you're favorite, right? Like, you know. <laughs> That's not what the quizzes are about, right? Quizzes are excuses to be talking to each other. So anything I can do to like remove any kind of friction from it, that's why I don't like doing like, have you ever had a like, clicker for a class or any of that kind of stuff? I have one in Seaside Board. It's, it's just, it just is not a good experience. No. The learning it gets in the way of the learning. Anyway, so um, if you have uh, feedback or something about this, it's going to pop up again, OK? So there's one at the end of chapter 34. Right? Um, we'll see. See how it goes. Technologically, it seems to be working now. It wasn't working earlier. Dispersion. Index of refraction is 
Something that changes with frequency, unfortunately. Now, in Physics 4C, we're not going to worry about this too much, but we do need to talk about a couple of features of dispersion because it brings up the electromagnetic spectrum and some other things. So what happens is, as your so, OK. You guys know the color of the rainbow? Roy G. Biff. OK. They Might Be Giants has a whole song about it. I should play it for some time. Okay. <clears throat> Roy G. Biff. Okay, he was a colorful man. Colors of the rainbow, all in his hand. Red. Red. Orange. Yellow. Green. Blue. Indigo. Indigo. Violet. Violet. That's why you should always look when you're pointing at me. Okay? What color is indigo? Brown. Yeah, it's between blue and violet. Like, not even Newton knew when he wrote this down, right? Okay? So, so, yeah. And whenever I hear the color indigo, of course, I go straight to Inigo Montoya. <laughs> you killed my father. The bear who died. One of the greatest characters of all time in any movie, anyway. So, what happens is, as you go across the visible spectrum, and this is the electromagnetic spectrum, but particularly the visible spectrum, okay? You can see how. The index starts high with higher frequency. Oh, that's why I was going with this, right? Red, okay, is what we call the long wavelength, lower frequency light. Remember, speed of a wave is equal to wavelength times its frequency. Speed of wave depends on the medium it's traveling in, right? But wavelength and frequency are interchangeable and inverses of each other. So the bigger your wavelength, the longer your wavelength, the further the distance between peaks, the lower the frequency is going to be. And conversely, when you get to blue light, this is short wavelength light. And therefore, what kind of frequency? Higher frequency light. Okay. So what we can see here is we go from high frequency to the lower frequency, from shorter wavelength to longer wavelength, the index of refraction changes from a higher value to a lower value. And because of Snell's law and the fact that index of refraction does determine the angle at which things will do refraction, the shorter your wavelength, the higher your index of refraction, the more refraction is going to take place. So it turns out red light doesn't refract as much as blue light does. This is dispersion. And the reason it's called dispersion is because when you take all the colors of the rainbow, which is what color of light when you take them all? It's white light. It's white is the combination of all the colors. You take that and you shine it onto, say, a prism, okay? that prism is going to spread the light out and cause the separation or dispersion of all the frequencies into the rainbow of colors that we call the visible spectrum. And again, the red light doesn't bend as much as the blue light does because of this feature where the index of refraction is frequency dependent. All of that being said, we are not going to worry about that that frequency dependence when we're doing our calculations. When we give you the index of refraction of water of 1.33, that's like an average, like for a specific frequency, usually in the green part of the spectrum, which they lands us right in the middle of this. Okay. So just, just kind of be aware of this. For the, but the other reason I'm going to talk about dispersion, not only to introduce Roy G. Biv and talk about wavelengths and frequencies, because some really cool things when you shine light into spheres. So if you take some sunlight, uh, which is generally white light, right? I mean, OK. If you ask a kid to draw a picture of the sun, what color crayon do they reach for? Oh, it's red. No, they reach for brown. Okay. <laughs> they reach for yellow. Because it's going to be yellow, right? No, the sun is not yellow. What color is the sun? White. It's white. OK. So why does it look yellow down here? The blue light was scattered out more and scattering later. Much later when we get to the interference of the pressure. So the blue light, and where did where does the blue light go? Sky. The sky. 
Okay. That leaves, okay. Oh, where, what happened to the green, right? <laughs> Not later. Okay. Leaves you up. But sunlight is still still contains these things. And you know it contains blues, right? Because sunlight causes blue flowers to look blue. But the sunlight will impinge with all those colors. The red and the blue ends of the spectrum will start spreading out as they pass through this spherical structure. And in doing so, with two bounces, okay, in the water, and these are not total internal reflection, they don't not necessarily total internal reflection. So there'll be transmission, right? For that R and the V for the red and the violet R. There'll be sunlight passing out of this spherical structure. Not a lot of light gets bounced off that first reflection. And then you have some refraction that comes out there. Okay. The reason I'm showing you this geometry and being cagey about spherical structures is because you get exactly an angle of two degrees of separation between red and violet light if that spherical structure is made of water. What is this? A rainbow. Rainbows are the result of dispersion in water drops when the sunlight enters the top of the drop. Sunlight entering the top of the drop will begin to disperse. It'll refract and begin to disperse because the indexes of refraction are different for different frequencies. They'll reflect off the back of the drop and then go through another refraction and spread out with a exactly two degree difference between the red and the violet. What this means is rainbows are always the same size and always take up exactly the same amount of your field of view, a two degree amount of your field of view. Replicate this with a lot of raindrops, and you'll be able to see the entire rainbow. So there needs to be a very specific set of atmospheric phenomena taking place in order for this to happen. You, if we go back to this picture, okay, the sunlight has to be entering where? The top of the drop. And actually coming like from behind you, right, entering from the back, okay, and there needs to be like raindrops or moisture in the air in front of you with the sun behind you. That is most likely to occur at ground level, either doing sunrise or sunset, where the sun is low to the horizon, so that the light can be coming over your shoulder and striking the water droplets that are in the air in front of you, okay? And if they do that, again, if it's like near sunset, like an hour or two before sunset, and it's been raining, what direction should you be looking for rainbows? Should you be looking at the sun? Not to the west. Look opposite the sun, right? Okay? Because if there's going to be light coming through, right, through the clouds, <laughs> if the too many clouds, you can't see this, right? Okay? But you need direct sunlight, and then you need this kind of, these water droplets suspended from rain that's not necessarily raining on you, but maybe on your neighbors or something like that, right? It comes in, causes that separation, and you see the rainbow. This is an actual picture of a rainbow that hasn't been photoshopped. My father took this one um, and sent it to me. It was, it was just a brilliant, brilliant bow um, captured on camera. I thought, you know, I could run saturation and a bunch of corrections on it, but I didn't. I wanted you to see that the real is as close as we could get, right, in a JPEG picture to what was going on. Notice the trees right here, right? You see how the trees are being hit with light at the top, but then there's a shadow underneath them. The sun is behind my dad taking this picture, right, okay, standing, standing in his uh, driveway, right, <coughs> behind him, right, with the sun hitting the tops of the trees and a lot of water droplets in the air to pull off that separation, that Roy G. bit, right? <coughs> because of the dispersion, because of the differences of index of refraction for every frequency of light. Okay. 
we're not done. Because there's some things that you need to understand about rainbows that nobody else knows, except physicists. Okay, so I'm going to let you in on some secrets of rainbows. What shape are rainbows? They're actually circles. They're actually 360 degree optical phenomena. But because of the angles that are present and the light that is there and the fact that most people looking at a rainbow are standing on the ground and the fact that you don't usually get a nice even spread of water droplets everywhere in your field of view. Usually people will only see like a section of a rainbow, right? The part where the water droplets are. Or as the ground gets in the way, right? We'll see just the 180 degree arc if you're very, very lucky. But in fact, if you can get high enough off the ground and have the sun be at the right angle, the water droplets be on the right spot, you can actually see the 360 degree rainbow. Pilots see this all the time. Pilots flying above the clouds with the sun, right? Even at like noonday at the zenith, if you look out of the window, you look down at the cloud, clouds are made of water droplets, right? And you will see the 360 degree rainbow with the shadow of the plane right in the middle. Okay, this was taken uh, from the top of a tower, I think, somewhere. Uh, in Malaysia, if I'm not mistaken, um, you can kind of see the shadow of the thing. Anyway, um, you can see where they, it sort of like fades out when you get into the shadow, right? But, but you can see that it is trying to be a 360 degree phenomenon. And that's dictated by the geometry of what you are seeing. But that's, that's not the most magnificent part. That's not the best kept secret about rainbows. You see, because of the optical phenomenon that's taking place and the geometry of the problem, the angles that are, present, uh, that are there, every single rainbow that you see, that you have seen and that you will see, is a rainbow that only you can see. In other words, it's your rainbow. Nobody else can see that rainbow because the angles are such that they're entering your eyes and if somebody's standing next to you going, oh, rainbow, same water droplets, same sunlight, but different geometry for them. Everybody gets their own personal rainbow. Your free gift for existing. Now this has several implications. Okay? Number one, next time you see a rainbow, you should stop and pause. And think about how the universe has conspired to give you your own personal rainbow. Just for you. Secondly, have you ever noticed how rainbows move with you? Maybe you've seen a rainbow if you're just squirting water out of the end of a hose. If you get a fine enough mist, you can actually see the rainbow in that mist, right? Okay? And as you wave it around, or maybe you've been driving behind somebody and just kicking up a lot of droplets and the sun's hitting and you can see the rainbow. And it's like going, or maybe you've seen a rainbow while you're driving, right? And the rainbow just follows, don't cry. The rainbow just follows you, right? As you're driving along at 60 miles an hour, it just moves with you, right? Why is it moving with you? Why is it always the same size? Why is it always the same distance away? Two degrees of separation, and it's yours. If you try to step closer to that rainbow, what does it do? It just moves back to keep that two degree separation and keep the physics happening the way physics has happened since the beginning of creation. This also means that leprechauns are some of the smartest beings in the universe. Because where do leprechauns keep their pots of gold? So that means that if you try to get to the end of the rainbow, step towards that rainbow, what happens to the greatest banking system in the universe? 
<laughs> it always stays the same distance away. Don't forget it's yours. All right. Miss Miguel mentioned that you can almost see the double bow. Okay. Yes. There are never just one rainbow. There's always two. Sometimes that second one is too faint to see. It really depends on how dark the clouds are and how bright the sun is and there's a host of features. But that second bow is always fainter than the first one. The first one can be faint enough, right? So the question is, where does the second rainbow come from? Well, for the leprechauns, it's got to be the national debt, right? Because you've got to have a place to store something. Where does it come from? No, You're close though. I told you that the I gave you a hint in the first rainbow picture I showed you. Which way is the sunlight entering the water droplet? So what happens when the water enters the bottom? Now we are of course assuming spherical raindrops, and no raindrop is ever spherically shaped. Okay. There's a little bit of fudge factor here, but the two degrees always works out, even with strangely shaped water droplets. Okay? But with sunlight entering the bottom of the droplet, which of course it does simultaneously with entering the top of the water droplet, right? It's not, it's not like it's on and off. It's not like the sun gets to decide top, bottom, top, bottom, right? No, it's the water droplet is illuminated all over. But the top one had one bounce. How many bounces do we have here? How many bounces, how many reflections in this picture? Two. I told you, at that bounce, it's not necessarily totally internally reflected. There is transmission of light as well as reflection of light. So we've got refraction coming into the droplet, dispersion happening all the way through the droplet, and on each bounce, there's a loss in energy. So with one bounce, you get a faint rainbow. With two bounces, you get an even fainter rainbow. And so the double bow is an extra special treat if you happen to have a situation where it's dark enough and simultaneously bright enough in that patch of sky for you to be able to see it. And indeed, my, my dad kept taking pictures, and the double bow did appear. Would, like, um, say, like, there's water at the bottom, would that, like, allow a rainbow to be more present and to say like just... You know, so like, like you try to like say over a lake or something like that? Yeah, like would it be better it, over a lake? Not necessarily. You just need water vapor in the sky. Okay. Yeah, you need, you need precipitation. Uh, why does it look like there's one side of the rainbow dividing like one lighter side and one darker side of most of these pictures? So like, are you talking about like when you go from here and then like the... the so it likes to look really faint and then it gets really bright and then it gets really faint again? Yeah. So. The blue indigos and violets don't travel as well through uh, the molecules of the atmosphere. There's a reason the sky is blue, right? When the sunlight hits the atmosphere, okay, the blue goes first. The blue scatters first, okay? And we'll, when we get to Rayleigh scatter and I tell you why the sky is blue and all that kind of stuff, you'll understand more about it here. But the blue, you can't see it as well through the air. Red, on the other hand, red travels really well. This is why sunsets are red, okay? And so that's why the red and the yellow and the green, they look more vibrant. It's just, it's just easier for them to go through the atmosphere. Big wavelengths travel really well around air molecules. Small wavelengths, they get shoved aside. Is that the reason for the varying like, thicknesses of the color band? Or are they all the same thickness, it's just not visible? It's because sunlight is inconsistent. It's white light because it contains all the frequencies, but not all the frequencies it needs to measure. I dodged a really sticky physics question right there. <laughs> oh, so, because the light enters the bottom of the raindrops on the, on the second rainbow, is it reverse the colors? Okay. Yeah, it's a double bounce. Actually, the first one's reversed, so it's a single bounce, and this is the actual order. Because on one reflection, it reverses. But on the second reflection, it re-reverses. <laughs> so 
I hope you're starting to get an idea of why I like optics. Optics, number one, is simple. <laughs> the math isn't all that hard. It get, upper level, it gets hard, but linear algebra solves all those problems. What drives me in, in my fascination of optics is that it's, it covers so many of these things that we see. And as a species, seeing something, right? is absolutely incredible. Having difficulty with vision is very traumatic. But our eyes, we've evolved our, these eyes, right, to be able to get information about our universe. And you just start in, in more ways than, say, mechanics. Like, you can only slide so many llamas down inclined planes. I can't remember what it was in the last semester before it. Penguin? Well, the penguin's in the homework, but what was the animal we used in class? Goat? It was a goat. You only slide so many goats down inclined planes before you get bored. I can't get bored of optics. Like, it just doesn't happen. And again, I'll keep showing you examples of why that is. Nothing's changed. Okay. Thank you for testing that for me. Let's move on to chapter 34. Okay, I did not put any of the poll anywhere things in chapter 34. So you can continue to keep ignoring that. All right, what we're doing in chapter 34 is we're going to formalize a lot of the stuff that I've talked about kind of already, right? Because we already talked about plane mirrors and all that sort of stuff, right? So you know that they reflect how? Front to back, not left to right, not up and down. So when an image is reversed, okay, there's some sort of plane where it, it's been mirrored or reversed, right? And you, you've heard me talk about vertical, horizontal, so left to right, up and down, front to back are typically the ways that we talk about what mirrors are doing in optics. But there's something else going on here, something very important, again, about how your brains work and interpret information about light. Okay? So for a plane mirror, a flat mirror, okay, you have an object, rays of light are coming off that object and they're bouncing off of the mirror. And you look into the mirror and you see, right? So talk to me about the distance. If I hold an object one, one meter in front of the mirror, where do you see that object inside the mirror? One meter away on the back side, right? So the image is inverted. It's inverted front to back. So we'll say an image is inverted or upright to say that there's been some sort of mess with one of the three ordinal directions. But does the thing you're seeing in the mirror exist where you are seeing it. Huh? Wish I could hang this up. I'm worried about direction. Okay. So you have this mirror right here, right? Okay. So if I come in here and right? I see myself. I'm one meter away. I see myself one meter inside, total distance two meters, right? Okay. I hold this up and sort of let you look into it, right? Okay. You see the class, right? You see you, you see the people sitting around you, all that kind of stuff, right? Do these people exist? <laughs> the ones you see in the mirror. <laughs> this is not an existential question. <laughs> this is a physics question, okay? If I take the mirror like this and I hold my hand like this, right? I was looking over this way. I would see my hand, right? Is there a hand over here? No. No. Where is this hand coming from? Reflection. <laughs> Put my lasers away. I do Okay. There's 
the reflected beam, right? The light comes in, strikes the mirror, and bounces up and hits, right? That's the reflection. That's the real light that went from my thing and headed it and up there. And how do I know that's real light? Because I can block it, right? I can get in the way of that beam of light. The image, the thing that's being hitting the screen, is real. But if we take our mirror and we look at it sideways, right? We put an object over here. Is there anything I can do on this side of the mirror to interrupt what I'm seeing in the mirror? No. This is the ultimate virtual reality. No computer required. Because the image that you see in this mirror is a virtual image. Why is it virtual? Because there are no real light rays present back here where you are seeing the class. All the real rays are on the front. So why do you, why do you not see it in front? Why do you see it inside of the mirror? Where is this image forming? There's only one place. No, nope. because your eyes only collect light in your brain. Real images can be projected on things. This is a real image coming out of that projector. How do I know it's a real image? I can block the real light rays that are present. This is a virtual image. And it only forms in one place, your brain. Every time you've looked into a mirror, you've looked at virtual you. Okay? You look a lot better than the one you see in the mirror. Okay? <coughs> virtual image. Because there's nothing back here. Why is our brain tricking us? I've already told you, we've evolved to do what? We make an assumption, our brain makes an assumption about how light works. What does light do? Travels in straight lines. And so, our brain will trace the rays back to their origin. And because our brains can't really deal with reflective surfaces, our brains don't understand, like our eye-brain connection doesn't understand the law of reflection. We will follow the real light rays that are hitting our eyes backwards and produce a virtual image. The location, the thing, everything that that light came from if it had traveled to us in a straight line. So images can be upright or inverted. They can be real or virtual. They can also be magnified or reduced. In a plain mirror, flat mirror, this doesn't happen. The magnification is one, meaning nothing has changed. Okay? But in this mirror, how do you see yourselves? Bigger or smaller? Smaller. Or smaller. Right? Okay. This mirror is not a plain mirror, right? It's a spherical mirror. It's a mirror that has been, its shape, okay, comes from the cross section of a sphere. Think of like a big, huge sphere made out of glass coated on the outside. And then we just sort of lop off a section of that sphere. That's not how they made this, right? But the cross section of the mirror is spherical. That was, uh, that was Dr. Kerfoot's mistake, not me. Okay? Right. So you've seen these mirrors before. I know you have. Where have you seen these? Hospitals, Hospitals um, stores, okay? In the hospital, they'll put them up in the corners, right? Why? They, why? So you can see around. So you can see around the corner, right? see, right, if somebody's coming the other way, 
guy with a gurney and a patient on him. You don't want to slam into them around the corner, right? In stores, they'll, they'll put them up, and then the cameras will look into the mirrors, right? The other thing you might notice is that you have kind of a wider field of view in this one. The image looks kind of warped and stretched out, okay, everywhere. So, spherical mirror. Now, this is called a convex mirror. It bows outwards, shiny side outwards. This is a convex mirror. Okay. Sorry, it's a concave mirror. Okay. What do you see? It's all upside down. It's all upside down? Interesting. Okay. So the goal, what we want to set out to do here is categorize these images. Are they upright or inverted? Have they been flipped in any way? Are they real or virtual? And are they magnified or reduced? That's kind of the goal. Okay. So what would you say about the image flip? Are we upright or inverted? Inverted, okay. Magnified or reduced? Interesting. Okay. Real or virtual? <laughs> okay. I'm about to do something. Unfortunately, this something is only going to work to the person that is right in front of the mirror. Okay. So I'm not going to be able to let everybody do this. In lab, you'll get a chance to do this. Okay. We do our optics lab next week. But um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold this right in front of the person. I want you to look at their reaction. Okay. And then if I if I'm if I'm torturing you with this mirror, you need to be able to describe to the class what you see. <laughs> What's going on? What did you see? A really big version of you? Were you upright or inverted? Upright. It was the same as right side up, right? Okay. And greatly magnified, right? Like, like it was disturbing me. <laughs> Am I wrong? It was kind of shocking, wasn't it? Like, oh, sorry. Right? Okay. I, I, I don't mean to be sexist, but I will do standard gender roles here. Ladies, what is this? Makeup yeah, it's a makeup mirror. Okay, you're a little compact, or maybe you got one standing up, right? Gentlemen, what is this? Shaving mirror. Nobody uses shaving mirrors anymore. <laughs> okay, but there's a shaving mirror. Shaving mirror is kind of like a, it's just like a compact mirror, right? Or or a makeup mirror, right? It just shaving mirror tends to be like just a little bit bigger. I don't know because guys are dumb or something. I don't know, right? <laughs> Maybe it's hard to hold and then cut your face at the same time. Okay, but what these do is they give you a much bigger version of it. <laughs> okay. Give you a much bigger version of yourself. I know, I need to shave. I can only shave twice a week, though. If I shave more than twice a week, the alien part of me comes out. No. Um, I get really red. <laughs> really bad. Acne. Um, so you get a really big... What? Who are you laughing at now? I'm glad I was funny. Okay. I don't have one of these in my, are you seeing me upside down? Yeah. yeah but I'm, okay, this is interesting, right? I'm seeing me right side up, magnified. You're seeing me upside down and reduced. Is it magnified for you? Okay, it kind of all depends. And it depends on these measurements and the geometry of the mirror. So let me introduce you to this. Um, I'm going to experiment on you guys a little bit. And I'm going to experiment pedagogically. Usually, usually, I would teach you how to do these things called ray tracing diagrams. I think for the first time, I'm actually not going to teach you that. <laughs> you remember it from two feet. Ray tracing is actually pretty good for the visually oriented among us. But, um, Computers are so good at it, and there are so many free apps online, like little applets and things like that. 
I'm not sure it's really necessary anymore. Kind of in the same way that slide rules aren't necessary anymore. We've got better ways of doing things. So I'm actually going to try this semester to not teach you ray tracing diagrams because they're in the book. It used to be that they were not in the book because the books would make you draw them yourself. But they're like all in the books now. And there's so many resources. Um, so in our lab next week, when you're going to be asked to draw diagrams, I don't think I'm going to ask you to draw the diagrams in the lab. I think we're just going to do the lab. And I just want to see what happens. Right? You're not going to miss out on much. If you're going into optics, come find me. I'll teach you how to do a ray tracing diagram. Right? They're not that hard. It's just they take a lot of time. And I've already used a lot of time in chapter 33, so I want to speed up chapter 34. So let's see what happens. Okay? So spherical mirrors have a center of curvature. It's basically the radius of the sphere that it would have come from if we built the whole sphere. The focal point, the point at which light rays are being brought to, like all the lights being focused down, okay? For a spherical mirror is always half of the radius of curvature. But we can do these things called ray tracing diagrams, which again, I'm not going to require you to do, but you'll see these pictures in the book. So it's, it's helpful to understand what's going on. Notice that there are objects, and the objects are always arrows in these diagrams, because arrows are easy to tell the orientation of what's going on. So if you look at the object, which is over here, Q and P, right? And then there's an image formed at the convergence of all the rays. They drew four rays, okay? And they followed geometry and the principles of reflection across the spherical mirror surface. If you follow those four rays, through all of their correct geometry, they will converge at a point. And that, since those four rays left the tip of the object, the place that they converge must be the tip of the image that's being formed. That image is inverted. How can I tell it's inverted just by looking at the picture? It's upside down, right? It was started with its orientation pointing up. And notice, its orientation is down now. That image is reduced. How can I tell it's reduced? It's smaller. It was taller as an object than the image. And because this is a scale diagram, I can actually look at the scale and say, oh, it looks to be one third the length of the original. So the magnification must be one-third, but actually negative one-third because the negative sign means inverted. And I can also tell you that this image is real. And why is this a real image? Because there are real rays, real light that bounce off of that mirror, converging at a point. So. This object in this diagram is way outside the focal length, F, and also way outside the radius of curvature, C. What do you see? Upright or inverted? Inverted. inverted. Reduced or magnified? Reduced. It'll be harder. It's reduced. Okay? Real or virtual? You're seeing a real image. And where is that real image forming? Somewhere out here. Okay? You're actually not seeing inside of this mirror, you're seeing an image that's formed out here. Okay? We'll get to the math of this. Don't worry. Okay? Here's a bunch more. Okay? So there's the replication of what was on the first slide that I just showed you, pretty much. Okay? Here, I'll take a picture of this one so it'll end up in the PDFs. Okay. And then what they're doing is they're successively taking the object and moving it like onto the center of curvature. And then they're putting it on the focal point. Something interesting happens when you put it on the focal point. The focal point is the point where the mirror focuses all rays. So if your object is at the focal point and light comes off the object and strikes the mirror, what will all the rays do? They'll be parallel to each other. Okay. This is how your headlights work. The headlights in your car have a bulb that sits at the focal point of the curved surface inside of your headlights. That's how the light 
from that little tiny bulb, instead of just being a single ray going out there, is this continuous beam. It's a bunch of parallel right rays going out to infinity. In truth, you don't have spherical cross sections in your, in your uh, headlights. You have parabolic ones, okay? Physics is the same. Yep. Yep. Flashlights, all those different kinds of things, right? Putting it at the focal point. And you can adjust, like in the magnet, you can adjust where the filament is, and sometimes you can make it spread out or get really narrow okay? and focus it down. Uh, but look at that last one right there. What happens when the image gets inside of the focal point of the mirror? So the, sorry, the object is inside the focal point. The rays come off, and now you're seeing dotted lines. Your eye over here is seeing all of these rays coming from somewhere. And your brain assumes light travels in a straight line. So it'll trace them all back and form what kind of image? A virtual image. Upright or inverted? Upright. Reduced or magnified? <laughs> right? Too big. Human too big. Right? Okay. So look you can look at the diagram. Like you can just look at the ray diagram and tell. If the image is forming on the back side of the mirror, and how do you know which side is the back side of a mirror? The not shiny side. Right? The side that you are not looking at. That's the back side of the mirror, right? If the image forms on the back side of the mirror, it has to be virtual. There can be no real light rays present. But if the image forms on the front side of the mirror, then you have real rays present and a real image. Oh, okay. I forgot. I took a picture of that one. Okay. Um, it doesn't work with just visible light. Okay, satellite TV, radio wave, okay. Any, any form of electromagnetic radiation, this can happen. This doesn't have to be reflective for visible light, but guess what? Metal, it's pretty reflective for radio signals. Radio signals will bounce off metal. Notice how they put the transceiver, the, the, the receiver for the radio signals. Where do you think they put that device? Right at the focal point of that spherical reflector, okay? Why are there two? One sends, one receives. No. Um, these are all, these are usually reception only devices. Uh, satellite internet is a send receive, that's a different situation. Is it image and sound? Ooh, very, you're close. Image and sound is, just carries on the band, it's really small compared to the image. You can see it's slightly offset to one side, right? So this dish actually has two focal points. You're, too, you're probably too young. One of them's for SD, the other's for HD. Later models would then combine it into one receiver again, where the SD signal was the HD signal simply cropped. But for a little while, they actually had different, different radio signals that were being sent for SD versus HD different bandwidth requirements. When you put this onto the convex mirror, right, there's really only one ray tracing diagram that exists. Yes, you can get further back, but you will always end up with a virtual image. Like no matter how close you get, how far away you get, you always see this thing on the back side of the mirror and it's always virtual. Objects in mirror are closer than they appear. Anybody that's tried backing up learns very quickly that the view inside of the passenger side mirror, not the driver's side, because it's illegal to have one of these in the driver's side mirror. Okay? That's a plane mirror. Why do they want a plane mirror in the driver's side mirror, but a bendy one in the passenger side mirror? This gives you a better field of view but it messes with your understanding of how fast things are going. 
because things that look small look far away, and because this thing always reduces images, everything always looks far away until you hit it. <laughs> but I swear it wasn't moving anywhere until it hit me. Right? And why have a plane mirror on the driver's side? So that everything is one to one. So that things appear exactly the same size. But you want that wider field of view to be able to look into a blind spot, which is why cars nowadays have blind spot sensors. Some cars have a driver's side wind, a mirror that cheats the law. It's plain for like 90%, and then they start curving the outer edge of it to give you a wider field of view. Backup cameras, uh, cameras that look into the blind spot and warn you when something's there, right? All ways to get around the blind spot. <laughs> Watch out. If you see something like this in the passenger side mirror, floor. I'll see you on Monday. We'll start doing the math of all of this offense.